Hello, this is Justin Okrahora, Scatterwork, and I'm here to talk about how you can support your employees to get PMP. It has some advantages, as you know, it enhances both the company and the individual project capability, and it leverages from decades of global project experience. Um, there have been hundreds of people who have contributed to the PM Buck Guide Project Management Body of Knowledge Guide, and you can see the, the up-to-date list in any edition. And uh, it accommodates the, the main trends in project management these days, which include agile, predictive, and uh, hybrid methodologies. Hybrid is the dominant one where there's a mixture. It gives valuable accreditation support for their career to the holders of the PMP. So there's something in it for the, uh, the people who get it, as well as for the company who sponsors it. So just to introduce Scatterwork, we help managers overcome their workplace challenges. And we, we give them um, co coaching, consulting and training and focus on the delivery of the priority initiatives. We have a virtual team. Um, we're, we're spread over a number of countries. We have different qualifications um, and skill sets, speak different languages and so on, and have been involved in this business uh, collectively. Well, we have over 100 years experience. We've served a lot of different sectors over the years, and uh, these are the main ones. And uh, we've also served many, many companies, small and medium enterprises, um, names you may not know of, but here are some larger clients that we've worked for as well. And uh, geographically, we've worked globally, uh, as you can see there, a fair amount in, in Europe, uh, parts of North Africa, Asia, right over to New Zealand and North and South America. So what are we going to talk about? Well, the first thing is, what is a project and why effective implementation of projects is important? And then various approaches to improving project capability. And one of these is indeed uh, a, a training of the, of the people who are doing it and uh, getting an accreditation. So how we support uh, this particular element, PMP, is also part of this session. So we start with... Why, what are projects and why is effective project implementation important? Well, if you think about it, a project is an organizational construct. We say, right, we've got a, we've got a team and we have meetings every so often and this is the way we communicate and these are the rules uh, and these are the people who make the decisions. So it's a, it's a construct. It, it doesn't sort of happen on its own. You have to write down and say, this is it. And it's very similar um, in a lot of ways to a company, which a company is written down and registered and so on. And then everyone acts as if it exists. So it's really good for implementing once off uh, deliverable. So deliverable, something that you get as a result. And it can be strategic or operational. And usually the biggest business constraints are time, cost and scope. And scope means, you know, what work are you actually going to do or what are you going to actually deliver? Um, so in any normal company, you've got years of experience and you've got processes and you've got products and so on. And you can pull from them. And um, I often refer to them as Lego blocks. And uh, then you can build more. So the scope is how much work you need on top of the Lego blocks, as it were, to deliver your project. So what a project can deliver, here are three categories of things. It could be an item, you know, for example, say build that wall. And then when the wall is built, well, then that's the deliverable. Or it could be a service. We might say we're going to issue a new type of insurance for um, young ladies under 25, um, drive their car, and it'll then cover some of the things that might be suitable for that age group and so on. Um, but the service is all of the things that go there, the definition, the calculations, the training of the people who are going to sell it, the brochures, um, the business case, all of that stuff. And you do that to set up the insurance. But once the insurance is set up, you stop doing the project and then you use it, which is operational and operational doing it again and again is different from a project. Project is what you do once. And it also could be a change of state. For example, the company applies for a quality rec uh, recognition of some sort and it's audited and then they say, right, you've got it. So um, those are the three categories of deliverable that we get out of projects. And um, as I said a couple of moments ago, they achieve deliverables um, so that a lot of people can work together. Now, in the old days, you think of building of um, the pyramids, for example, a lot of people work, but the way they did it there was, was probably they were slaves and they were just told to do it. Um, 
but in the modern world, um, we, we need things like shared objectives and so on, and shared rules. So as I said, a project is a bit like a company. Um, yeah, everyone agrees to act as if it existed. You know, these are the rules. And it provides a, co a framework for cooperation. And the deliverables that you can bring out are much more than you could do if you didn't have some sort of project um, structure. People use different words for project, program, venture, assignment, and so on. Um, but the, the key issue is that they're one-off. And because it's something that happens once, you really need to plan quite a lot in advance and then do it. So the balance between planning and doing is different compared to repetitive work where you it's all been set up and you just do it every day. So here are some um, uh, projects, the titles that we have from clients of ours. Um, the first one there, upgrade data quality in a database. So that's a project. You could say, mm, we're not too happy with the quality. There are a number of duplicates and um, some of the data is out of date. So we're going to tidy up the data with some sort of campaign to make sure that, that the data in the database is correct. And then when we finished, we say, right, we have now moved the quality of the data from this standard to that standard. So once off. Mm -hmm. um, that's an IT um, example. Another one I've got over on the right hand side, um, upgrade cyber security. We, we all know that in the current um, environment, there's plenty of um, hacking going on and so on and uh, threats and so on. So a company could say, right, we're going to do that. But you don't just sort of do bits and pieces. You put them in a package and then you say, right, we're going to do all of them. And then you work it out. And when it's done, you, you, you say, right, it's finished. Now, you might do another package after, but the, the key thing of a project is it's once off. So it helps, um, project management helps address complexity because, for example, um, things like digitalization uh, is, is spreading out. Particularly, it was given a big push by COVID, of course, where people had to work at the so-called home office. And then there were realizations on the one hand that you can do quite a lot of things like that. And on the other hand, uh, that... Um, you don't necessarily need to travel all the time or to be physically in an office um, uh, to do everything. And, and of course, people are more familiar with how to do it. So that has taken, uh, that's accelerating. But when you get things like climate action um, that, that we need, you know, and it goes into so many different areas, energy, and it goes into all different industry branches, like, you know, transport and farming and, and so on and so on. And basically, if you want progress, you have to pick out some particular thing and say, this is what we're going to do. And that's a project. And um, if you're slow in doing that, uh, well, then you might be too late. You know, I give you an example out of climate action is that um, if you install an oil boiler now, well, it probably lasts about 20 years. And by the time that's happened, you know, we'll be 20 years nearer to, to doomsday. <laughs> So, um, you know, that there should be a decision right now. And in some places, it's already so that even today, you're not allowed to, to install a new oil boiler, you have to do something else. But the point is this, that if the, the delays, if projects are, you know, one has to be finished as the basis for the next, then you need really good project management to get them done as quick as you can. Here are some other uh, technological developments that are accelerating the way people are working. Cloud computing, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, autonomy for, you know, for self-driving cars, for example, cybersecurity, blockchain, additive manufacturing, you know, printing buildings and, you know, uh, and so on. And there are so many things going on at once that unless um, you've got a good focus on what they are, um, they, they don't happen. So the typical business constraints are scope, um, and, and I put that at the top because what's, the scope is what work has to be done on this project. And that affects cost and time, and it also affects training requirements and, of course, other things as well. Um, but the scope, as I say, of a project is usually from where we are now, what do we need to do? And very often we use all the other per processes and so on that we've already got. Time to um, is a constraint, but time to market is an interesting one because, for example, if you get there, supposing there's several companies are, are aiming for the same product or service, and one of them gets there fast first, so they charge whatever they like uh, or what they can get away with um, because they're the only ones there, no competition, and, and if it's really good, well, then people will pay for it. 
and then they will probably decrease their price a bit, having having paid for the research. And anyone who comes in the second place can't go for those high prices anymore, and you can't pay the research back. So it makes it it's a sort of a, a win lose situation. If you get there first, it's okay, and if you don't, it's not okay. So time to market really matters. And then another thing, of course, is how much time effort goes in. So time investment. And um, again, if you do things properly, you you, you can um, avoid repetitive work and rework and things like that. And then, of course, cost is a business constraint because, you know, if you're going to do a project, yeah, clearly you don't want to find that the real cost of doing it is more than the, the benefit that you get out of it. So another thing that, that fits in with this whole overall picture is the pace of change. Uh, like long ago, people used to go to the garage and get their car fixed. And they, my father used to do this, I remember. And he, they said, oh, yeah, it's OK. We, we'll send you an invoice every six months and, um, you know, you can pay it then. And then when the, the mini came out, the car in the middle, um, they, they the technology was improved, but you still had to change the oil every so often and check the tires every week and things like that. And then these days you move on to the to the electric car and it has a software update every week or something like that. So the whole pace of things is 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 changing. And if you want to go address things like I say climate change. Because the, the quicker you go through the cycle of, in, of you know, doing a project which becomes the basis of the next one, then the more likely you are to come out at the other end, um, you know, staying on top of things. There are some risks uh, if you have ineffective project implementation. I've only picked out a couple here. Um, but the competitor takes the profits and set the price. I've already mentioned that if they get there first. Um, another one, cost overtake the revenue benefits. Um, again, I mentioned that you can go start on some project and when you actually deliver it, you think, gee, it's getting, you know, it's not worth it anymore. For whatever reason, the costs have gone out of control. And another one is employees might go to employers that are more in, in tune with their their wishes. That's been happening, <clears throat> particularly since COVID. I've heard terms like the great resignation, which means that people are, you know, they're leaving their job or they decided not to go back to work or you know, things like that. Um, employees are far more free moving than they used to be a generation back. And uh, obviously, a project is run by people. So, you know, if you lose the people, you can't run the project. So let's have a look at um, three different ways of improving the project capability. You know, it, it, projects are not the be all and end all of the world, but they're certainly an important part. And um, the three I have here is is personal or professional experience, somehow leveraging from that. Another one is um, is to use standards. If a standard is put together based on a lot of experience and we follow the standard, um, then we, we've got some benefits there, which I'll go into in a few moments. And then the third one is education, which is, is our particular um, niche, as it were. And I can show you some things that we have there. All projects are animated by people. That's, that's fairly clear, I think. Um, and it doesn't matter how good the, the uh, artificial intelligence is or the equipment or the tools or whatever. It still needs people in the middle um, who decide, right, this is the one we want to do. And um, they share or transfer their experience. So is the, 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 shall we say that the more experienced people have, the more they have to transfer. And um, the, the experience might be organizational or technical. So for example, they may have experience that organizing in a particular way, having a particular way of sending emails and minutes of meetings and so on uh, is is very useful. You know, and that might be true independent of the project itself. So sometimes people say, well, I'm, I'm not really familiar with that type of project, but they may have organizational experience or they may have technical experience that they bring with them and transfer into the project. So obviously, the more experienced people have, then the better for the project. But also, one way of getting more experience is having a diverse team. So if you have people and they're all from the same small island, for example, well, then they'll have roughly the same experience. And um, it's one of the nice things about globalized world is that we can bring people in from all sorts of different backgrounds and um, we can benefit from that. So that's one, one area of, of interest, OK? Now, a second one is standards. So if this, what often happens is that in a particular area, there are developments and then bit by bit, the leaders in that area, they say, we really do need to tie this down and um, 
stabilize it and so on and they develop a standard and then standards are proposed at maybe at a national level um, and they go through various tests and committees and so on and and then if that's accepted well then maybe often the, a national one is proposed as an international one and again it goes through a similar sort of thing but the point is that by the time that the standard has been laid down um then you've got a you're building in the experience of all of those people that are feeding into it so a good example of that is uh, what I call the famous PMBOK guide um, of the Project Management Institute. Um, it's been written um, over, well, the, the, the organization has existed over 50 years. And um, somewhere along the way, somebody said to them, you know, you should write it down, all of this experience you have. And, and it turned into this book, and then it's into the seventh edition now. And every time it's updated, there, there are committees in different areas and um, that, that, that work on, on, the, on the book and uh, bring it up to date and, and so on. And it's also based on um, real experience. They do um, surveys to find out what project managers really do. And um, that all feeds into it. So all of that means that if you use that, that um, guide, project management, body of knowledge guide, you're leveraging, but it became a standard as well because it was proposed as an American standard. And a lot of people would say, yeah, that sounds good to me, we'll, we'll use it. So if a company decides, okay, instead of uh, sort of being generalist, um, let's set a particular project standard. I mean, to, to give a stupid, or sort of a very simple example, a country usually decides, are we gonna drive on the right or on the left? Yeah? And, you know, once you've decided, then that, that you know, then you, you move ahead and you get vehicles that suit and you do the road markings to suit and so on. And um, if you didn't have that decision, you'd have the situation that you might have had, you know, 100 years ago where people wandered across the road one way and the other. And it makes it very difficult. So it's the same if a company says, oh, we, you know, we accept all of the we, we don't really go. We have our own methods. But a better way of doing it is to pick a big uh, project standard and then say, right, everything that we do in the company fits under this umbrella. And then that gives you some real advantages. So it means that the work methods and personal development are aligned with a wider base outside the company. You have more streamlined interaction with people outside the company services and so on. If you say, ah, oh, yeah, but we're special, we have our own way of doing things, then you effectively take ownership of the training. And it means everyone who wants to work with you, you have to give them a training program. It's much easier to say, we use this standard. So I mentioned there about um, standards. Um, sometimes you get situations where there's a new standard because of maybe technological developments. And of course, the people who contribute to the development of that standard, they get extra benefit. Everything as that we use moving forward is based on things that we've done before. I've, I've used that term Lego block. But for example, if a company decides um, it's going to stick to a particular project standard, then that's a block. And then it means other things can be consistent with it within the company and you get better uh, payback as it were for your efforts the blocks say they might be combined in different ways for example uh, you might have business processes and you might use them you know in different ways you might plug them together in different ways or you might have different business models or um, you might have physical things that are plugged together and we've seen a lot of examples of that in the last few years with um, for example Uber and the taxis, you know, taxis already existed, the internet already existed, um, but the business model was, very, you know, very quick uh, communication of of um, demand and, and a sort of, um, what would you like, a competition, if you like, between drivers, whoever is near says, yes, I'll take that, and so on. So you've got new business models, but of course, the more of those you have, the more opportunities you have. An example uh, of the validity of a standard, um, you know, that is that is is the euro. Yeah? So, for example, at the beginning, um, there were twelve countries. The day the day that the currency as cash was introduced, there were twelve countries, and there are now twenty. So, what that means is that if you're traveling now in twenty countries instead of twelve, you don't need to change your money. Um, you know, it's all the same value wherever you go, and so on. So, that's a standard. No, it's not an industrial standard, it's more a commercial one. But if we think of it in the same way, that if we have a standard, for example, the PM body of knowledge guide, 
is an American standard and and it's referred to by people in you know lots of different places. Well, then the more people that, that use it, then obviously the more valuable it is. So the third thing that we can do, uh, at least, you know, there's a whole range of things, but one of them is education of the practitioners, because if you want people to do projects effectively, you, you, you can't just sort of throw them in and, and tell them to read it up on their own. So obviously we're going to have education and training of some sort. And um, a feature of training is that the person who benefits is the trainee, not the company. Um, for example, you might say, right, we're going to do agile project management and um, you set everything up and then you send everyone to training and so on. Now, that enables them to, to work agilely, but most of the people except the senior managers cannot demand that the project be done on that basis. The, the, the trainee gets the learning and they can use it if they get an opportunity, but it's not a way of making money quick as it were. Um, but you need a certain level of maturity within the company. And of course you might say, right, one of the ways we're gonna get this is by doing um, uh, project management training. The training might be in standards um, because then you're leveraging from uh, big experience with other people or maybe methodologies um methodologies are, are more detailed you know do it this way do it that way and you know this is called this and that's called that and so on and um if there are existing methodologies that fit in with the way that you're working well then that's brilliant because then you 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 have you've got a more solid um foundation so here are some selected project organizations and the standards that they have i've mentioned project management institute a couple of times and their pmbok guide very widely used. Another one is called Prince too. There was a Prince, and then they realized it would it was done in IT, and then they realized it actually applied to anything. So they they revised it, and originally it belonged to the uh, UK state, and then in more recent times they they split the ownership. So they have a big interest in it, but not a not a, a controlling interest. IPMA is interesting. International Project Management Association. It has about 70 member associations throughout the world, project management associations in different countries and so on. And um, it also obviously defines um, a st broad standards against which the accreditation is, is carried out. Um, but by definition, it varies from one place to another. Uh, the detail varies, uh, for example, what language the exam is in. Yeah? And then you've got the um, I, uh, ISO, International Organization for Standardization, and they have um, a, a standard. And uh, I think it would be fair to say that it reflects very strongly the PMBOK guide, but it's a much smaller document, but, it, but it's an international standard. And then the European Commission have a process called, or a, um, a project management methodology called PM squared. And it's open source, and it includes a lot of things that are not as strongly emphasized in some of the other methodologies. So it's a, it's a really good one to work with because you, you don't need to buy the book, you just download it. And methodologies, predictive, this would be the way probably a lot of us were brought up. You know, you people are asked, how long will it take to do this? And you estimate the time, and then you do a, a, a Gantt chart or bar chart to show when it's going to happen and so on. Um, so the, 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 that's the way predictive tends to work. You say, this is what we want. And if we don't get it, we keep working at it until, until it's finished. Huh? Um, Agile takes a different approach. It emerged in the IT uh, area, but it's very, very appropriate to any sort of knowledge work um, where changes can be done effectively at no physical cost. Um, and the way that they work is that instead of setting the scope and saying, this is what we're going to do, they set the time, they call it a time box, and they say, right, you've got an iteration, and it's going to last, let's say, four weeks, and um, during that time, these are all the things we're going to hope to do, and when you get to the end, you stop, and then you reprioritize before you do another cycle. Hybrid, um, in the real world, you tend to get both of these. Um, by each other they both have strong points for example you can't use agile methodology if the cost of moving something is big I'll give you an example you might be building a bridge or something like that you you can't sort of say oh you know we, we wanted it four lanes instead of two or we wanted it in a slightly different position obviously the bridge you can't just sort of move it in the middle so for things like that you need a predictive approach 
So it's not as though every project has to be predictive, um, to be agile or predictive, but you know there, there can be features of agile that you use in the predictive environment. And then there's a there's a, an opinion that agile itself has been around about twenty years, and that you know somewhere along the line it will become outdated, um, and you'll be moving more into continuous projects. You know, instead of doing a project and then back to your normal work, um, what you would actually do is, um, a, a, you know, you'd be moving from one project to another all the time. So the third section of this here has to do with. Um, the services that we provide at Scatterwork to help all of that. And as I say, it's a niche. We're not saying that this is the complete solution to everything. But if an organization wants to be mature in project management, one of the really good ways of doing it is to get this PMP um, certification, which is based on the PM Bar guide. There are about a million people, a million, 200,000 or something, who have actually got this globally. So it's a very, very well um, re respected um, accreditation. Um, and it takes a certain amount of study, obviously. And we're, we're offering a service to make that as easy as possible for the people who are involved. So how do we do it? Well, one um, aspect of it is that uh, if you are a decision maker within a company and you say, yeah, we've got a lot of people and it would be a good idea if they did um, PMP. These are the things that we could mention um, to them. So obviously there are discounts the bigger the group then it's easier to 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 pass on some of the benefit of that custom scheduling we work globally any time of the week any time of day so some people might say mm, fridays and saturdays somebody else might say well days and evenings somebody else would say no it's only working days and of course different cultural zones have different days for the weekend and so on so we cover all of that if we do um, a, a group booking um, with a company, it, it could happen that some of the people involved there to say, yeah, yeah, but I can't turn up to the workshop that you've scheduled for us. But the way that we have it is we we, we can say, that's fine. You, in, individuals can go to um, uh, different workshops um, that, that have different schedules. In fact, existing schedules. Um, but you might have an, so many that, that, have, that would find it useful to have a particular schedule that you say, right, we'll run so many basic, but for the people who can't fit in, they can look at the calendar and pick out another one. We can do on-site or online delivery, and we're happy to do both. Um, but I would have to say that the, um, the, the, the energy saving in on-site is enormous. Um, you know, you don't have to travel, you don't have to stay in hotels, you don't have to have lots of people from one region, um, and then you can get a critical mass of participants um, more easily. Um, but, you know, there are situations where people say, no, 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 we really want this on, on site. Um, the workshop spoken language can be, uh, uh, our normal base language is English, but uh, we can also do the workshop spoken language in German or French. Um, and that can be convenient where you have people who are sort of passively good at, at English and they can read the slides and so on. Um, but they would prefer to have um, interactions and discussions in their own language. Um, so that's an option that's available, as I say, to a corporate client. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the uh, bookings for, for PMP are done, you know, prepay with a credit card and so on. But you, you can't do that if you've got, you know, 50 or 100 people. Obviously, you've got to do it with invoices. Um, so we're happy to facilitate that. So those are several features um, for decision makers. And then with one extra one is that they can, a decision maker can say, yeah, I'd like to just sort of sit in on one of your live courses online to get a flavor of how it works. And um, we're happy to support that. Um, and all you have to do is ask us. It's very simple. Um, if you're in Ireland, uh, there is, there's a system where um, basically some taxation is pointed directly at uh, industrial training. And uh, a lot of this goes through um, a mechanism called skill nets. And you get skill nets either um, there are companies that are either in the same branch or in the same region. Mm -hmm. And there are many of them. And uh, IFS Skillnet is one of the ones that we work with, for example. So if your company is in the international financial services and you're, you're, if the company is signed up um, to the Skillnet, 
then the company gets a, a reduction on fees. So if you're a decision maker and you'd be interested to follow that through, uh, just uh, to visit an online course and then have a, a, an opportunity to talk about it with one of us, then then feel free. You can go on the website or, or send an email and you'll find the contact data. On the website also, we have a calendar. So you can go in and, um, and, and click when, when it would be convenient to talk. Um, that, that saves a lot of time. People are very busy, so they can say, yeah, at that time I'll be there and uh, have the discussion then. Okay, what are the advantages for the individual? I mean, we've been talking the last while about advantages for the company. Um, but if you do one of our programs, uh, you, you, you're guaranteed to get, uh, and you attend it properly, <laughs> you're guaranteed to get the certificate which says you did 35 hours of training in project management, which is a prerequisite um, for, for even being allowed into the exam. And it makes sure that you, do, you, you understand tasks and enablers and people and processes and how it all fits together uh, in, in such a way that you can actually do the exam. Uh, as a as a result of this and the private study, the the private study takes the the, the rough estimates that the entire program takes, including the workshop, takes about let's say of the order of magnitude of a hundred hours. Okay, it's not five hundred and it's not twenty. You know, somewhere in the middle, and we do have statistics that tell us that that's probably a good estimate. So we, we support you with recognizing both the content and format of the exam question, because an exam is an exam and uh, exam technique doesn't go against your course. It helps you um, pass. Our system, it helps you identify areas where you need to um, put a bit more effort to get going. So that, that's OK. It just means that your time is more um, effectively used. And by the time you get to the end of our program, you, you're actually ready. And I have to say, uh, in reality, we get very few people who, who fail. Some advantages here for the participants themselves. Um, one of them is that the, the, the fee includes the exam fee, which normally is separate to PMI, but we handle that for you. Um, and also we, we handle the actual booking for you. So, you know, you only have to do it once. And instead of learning how to do it, we say, just, you know, give it to us, we'll do it. You get that certificate I mentioned. You have the workshop language, which we spoke about. Um, and then we've got a lot of content and service. For example, we've got quizzes per module, which um, uh, focus on, on the things that you need um, for the exam. And then we have, um, for example, videos of every module. And you, you could say as part of your revision, you'd like to go back to module so-and-so again. And that's fine. You just look at the schedule and you say, yeah, I want to go to the, the second half of day two or something like that. And, and off you go. So that's that's something that we do. We're very happy to do that. If you have to make a moderate absence, that's unavoidable. We, we all have things like that. There's, we have a mechanism for getting around that. Um, because if we didn't, and you know, you miss so many hours, we wouldn't be able to issue the certificate, but we have a mechanism that uh, basically of, of, of studying what you missed and, and doing a test on it. You might be audited by PMI. They, they don't audit everyone. I hear it's about, you know, one in four or something like that. So, you know, there's a, it's a non-zero chance that you'll be audited. And if that happens, we'll help you with it. And if a, a, a workshop is scheduled, it will definitely happen. Uh, it doesn't go public unless we know that it's going to run. And um, then you've got access to everything, all the supports for a year. And even that, you can extend it. Um, if, for example, you know you changed job in the middle or you were ill or something like that, and you want to extend it by paying an additional fee, you can actually retain access to the learning materials. So if you if an individual wants to book a workshop, they can go directly to the website. They pick a date and a preferred format. For example, five days uh, is what you might call traditional, but sometimes we run events that are nine evenings. Uh, so it's shorter events, but over more days and so on. And then you just book and pay with the credit card. That's right, for an individual. And we guess that if you're if you're an employee, then you would probably expense that. When you go into the, the calendar, you'll see on the website, you'll see this type of thing. And what it shows you is the start and end date of the course. And here, this one says it's a five-day course as it happens. And then it reads the time off your computer and it, and it does a conversion of, of the universal time. So 
what's of importance to you is this here. What time is, is it where you are with your time zone? And the booking now will accommodate up to seven people because from eight on, you're talking about a group booking. A, a visit to the live website uh, will uh, help you uh, decipher all of those things there. But if I, I'd like to summarize the whole thing and say this. Uh, projects are important because they are a way of getting things done and uh, getting them done without any messing and as quickly as you can means that the whole pace can increase not not with more effort just by being more careful with communications very often and then if you want to work on a project basis so companies do obviously then there are a number of things that they can do to make that better and, and to improve the maturity and one of them is, for example, that the company can decide on a particular project standard and say, this is the one that we're going for. And then at another level, um, the people who are actually implementing things under that umbrella, they need education as well. And um, the, the PMP is, is a very good program for that. It's very, very widely recognized. Um, and it takes you through really everything about projects. Um, so it's it's great to build up the the. Um, I would say the maturity of uh, both the company and the individual. So I hope that was useful to you. And um, please feel free to contact us if you have any queries. Thanks very much.